Hello everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all again for coming out tonight. You know, a couple of things I just want to say. First of all, I'm very happy to see you in person. Yeah. I've been telling my staff, please, no more Zoom. Please, God help us, please, no. And second, I want to just warn you, I'm going to be pretty opinionated tonight. In fact, if you've never seen me speak before, you should probably put your seatbelt on right now. You know, and if you're woke, even better. You know, because we can choose to disagree. I might say some things that you might disagree with, but we can choose to disagree because that's America. You know, we speak in very loud voices and heated arguments about things that we feel passionate about. We left the House of Lords and decorum a long time ago. So I know this has been a particularly challenging year and I'm glad we can convene like this to talk about it. And uh, you know, before we get too far, I just want to reflect a little bit on some of the things that uh, we talked about last time we gathered like this. Last time we gathered like this, the uh, Dow was at roughly 35,000. And uh, we discussed last summer down at the beach that we think that things are going to be a little bit volatile. We're going to have a whole lot of up and down and a whole lot of noise, but no real forward progress. And that would probably go on for a number of years. And since that time, the Dow did get up to roughly 37,000 at the top. Uh, last uh, recently, it dropped down to just under 30,000. And now we're working our way backward about 35.7 or 32.7, somewhere around there. So we're starting the low, long and steady climb back. We call that climbing the wall of worry. And you know, we, I may not get every single detail right for these things, you know, not every single minute detail, but I do tend to get the trend correct. And you know what, you can check me on that. You might notice we have our video guys running around tonight just like every year. And I do believe in video. I think it's a great way to communicate ideas and to add color to the conversation. But the other thing we can do is we can go back into history. We archive this stuff and we can say, did the stuff we was talking about, you know, in the past, years ago, did it come to fruition? And I think that you'll find if you go back and check some of the things that mostly, yes, it did more or less come true. So we do a lot of work on YouTube. And if you go to YouTube and just type Valark in the search box, it'll come right up and you will find years and years of archived data, as well as some fun things in there too. We're also on Vimeo. Vimeo is a little bit more high quality of a streaming platform. And this is where we archive some of our more artistic pieces, like when Elmo came to visit us. That's a funny one. If you haven't seen it, you should. But also on Facebook. And we do a lot of work on Facebook, and I would encourage you, if you haven't liked us on Facebook yet, and if you are a Facebook user, please find us, please like us there. And the reason is, is because we publish a lot of market update video. And this is one of the best ways that I can reach 600 people, you know, really, really quickly. So we publish market updates here, four, five, six minute short, concise pieces on a semi-regular basis that helps you to understand what we are thinking about, what we're watching, what we're monitoring, what our game plan is. And especially when times get weird, that's a great way to get some peace of mind that we are actually there and doing stuff. It's difficult to have 600 people call in and to call them back again. So we use a lot of these kinds of tools to help us. Obviously, this year has been very scary. We've had to do a lot of videos. There's lots of scary news. And by the way, I would caution you to be careful of something called clickbait. Are you familiar with clickbait? I know some of you are. So what is clickbait? Clickbait is sensational headlines designed to get you to click onto something. And uh, you know this can be sensational either to the positive or the negative, but that's because all of these social media and news sites are paid by the click. Every time you click on it, whether you read the whole thing or not, it doesn't matter. You know th those guys earn like some per one tenth of a penny or something. 
So it sensationalized stories, not just to the negative, but also to the positive. And I want to encourage you to look for trusted and factual news outlets. And many of them, in fact, synthesize what you see and what you read and what you take in uh, from many different sources until it starts to form a picture that makes sense for you. Think about it. Over the COVID area, or era, we were all walking around in our phones like this, you know, reading stuff because we couldn't go to the office, we couldn't work, so all of our source of information was coming on the phones. We were getting all hunched over, you know. And if all of your data comes from your phone, and by the way, no one under 50 uses anything except their phone. The five or six platforms that drive the information on your phone all lean left. They all lean left. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just a fact, it's, that's just what it is. So if all of your data comes from your phone, you're probably only getting one side of the equation. And I hope this presentation will help a little bit with that. Anyway, uh, so last year we started talking about a lot of changes that we would like to make to the portfolios. Last March, you know, early in the springtime going into summertime, we were reaching out to a lot of folks and making some adjustments. And we were going from a growth portfolio or a moderately aggressive portfolio, growth-oriented investments from really great companies, and we still love those things. But after 10, 12, 15 or so years of really strong growth, it made sense to start to pull back on the reins and to take a more balanced approach. And that bore fruit. You know, uh, we gravitated away from technology and growth-oriented investments. And many of you had growth funds, you know, that had done very, very well. And it's difficult, I know, sometimes when we take an investment that has done well and we switch it into something that is designed to be more conservative, risk-protected, and have it immediately go down. And that's what happened. You know, because we did run into difficult times, the market did go down, and when it goes down, lots of things go down. All boats sink on a low, lowering tide, right? But I can assure you, had we not made those changes, we would have seen a lot worse downturn than we did. Not every move has led to gains, but we have led to lesser downturns than we would have had we not made some of those moves. And as difficult as this year has been, I think we have to ask ourselves, are we market timers or are we investors? And I'm gonna suggest that for the vast majority of us, the vast majority of our portfolios and accounts, we are investors. And that means when things get weird, when things get a little bit wild, we hold fast. Probably in those scenarios, the best course of action is to batten down the hatches, bring in the cat, trim the sails, and ride the storm straight through. Many times the best way out of something is to punch straight through it. Unfortunately, the traditional asset allocation mix of 60% stocks and 60% bonds is having its worst first half of a year since 1970. So all of these years, all were better in the first half of the year than 2020 was for a mix of 60%, 40%, 60 stocks, 40 bonds. So it's challenging to say asset allocation, you know, one thing goes down, something else goes up, they kind of cancel each other out, it should be good, right? Except that in the last 50 years, there have only been three times that stocks and bonds went down together, and guess what? This just happens to be one of those three times. So it is, the, but is it the end of the world? I don't think so. And I'll share with you the details as to why we think that's true. And there's lots of questions, lots of concerns, lots of clickbait. The big one right now, for instance, is are we headed for another housing market meltdown? We're seeing you know, news reports, housing has come, what's the word? Oh yeah, CNBC. Housing has cratered. Cratered? Yeah, there's a slowdown in the housing market and prices are starting to come down. But the housing market is in far better shape today than it was in 2008. And the risk of that kind of a meltdown is remote. But again, clickbait. And as you surf through your news sources, I want to have you ask yourself, is it a rational, 
thought out, truthful argument, or is it sensationalized, designed to get you to get your head into a tizzy? It's important to remember that big stock market downturns are normal. They're perfectly healthy. They're needed to burn off some of the exuberance that we see sometimes. At 35,000 last summer, the Dow was overpriced. At 37,000, it's even more overpriced. So it would be normal for us to burn off some steam and to release some of that pressure and for investments to rebalance. Since 1950, the S&P 500, these little gaps here, these gray bars, since 1950, the S&P 500 has fallen 20% or more on more than 10 separate occasions. We have a bear market about as often as we change presidents. So certainly there are issues to overcome and there are problems to resolve, but I would suggest to you they all fall into one big giant category that I call lack of leadership. Now some of you may know I'm a student of leadership. I follow this stuff. I study this stuff. I teach this stuff. I'm a squadron commander in the Civil Air Patrol. That's me right there. So this is my... Thank you. Thank you. So this is my squadron of cadets and seniors. It's a leadership laboratory. We learn this stuff. We teach this stuff. So I'm just calling it how I see it. You want to see a little bit of what true leadership looks like? These are some books from my personal library. And I brought them along up here up front. I'll leave them up here if you'd like to take a look a little bit later on. This one over here, Tribes, says that true leaders are not chosen. They are not appointed. They are not elected. They are called to action by necessity. So, you know, they see a gap. They see that there's a need for leadership. They cannot help but rise to the occasion. This one here says what you really need to lead is you have to give a damn. You have to care about whatever the organization or the cause is. And if you don't care, you can't lead. You have to care about it like you own it. I love this one from General Mattis, the general that uh, defeated the Taliban. No gruff, he's gonna ruffle feathers. He tells it like he sees it, I love it. By the way, this book, call sign, his call sign chaos, that call sign chaos is an acronym. It stands for Colonel has another outstanding suggestion. <laughs> I love it. But uh, here's my favorite one of the moment. It's called Extreme Ownership, and it's written by the commander of the top performing SEAL team of all time. And he suggests that true leaders take responsibility for everything. If something goes wrong on their project or their task or whatever it is, it's not the external force or the external person that caused it. It's not that fault. It's their fault for failing to see that circumstance and put into effect a plan that would prevent it from happening. If they don't succeed on their mission, it's not because some external force caused them to fail. It's because they, as a leader, failed to develop a plan that would guarantee success. They own everything. And yet this current administration takes ownership for nothing. The buck doesn't stop at all. So yeah, leadership problem. And one of the side effects of that is the inflation that we are now experiencing. We saw it coming, I saw it coming, everyone saw it coming. This is a screenshot from one of the uh, market update videos we posted on uh, Facebook from back in November. And we were talking about this very topic well before the mainstream media was picking it up. So yeah, we saw it coming, but in my opinion, and in the opinion of others, including even Jeff Bezos, this is a self-inflicted wound. Massive amounts of stimulus, followed by more massive amounts of stimulus, far in excess of what was actually needed to solve the problem. In fact, so much so, there is still 200 billion of stimulus dollars rattling around out there that is unallocated to any particular need. Here's a fun example. I received an unsolicited email from a CPA firm a little while ago that specializes in something called the Employee Retention Tax Credit. 
And this is a tax credit that business owners would receive up to $26,000 for every employee that they kept on their payroll during COVID. God bless them, keeping them on their payroll during COVID. That's great. But now all they have to do is apply for this you know, tax refund and up to $26,000 per employee can be coming their way. Imagine if I owned a factory, a small manufacturer, and I have 200 employees running around and I get a $26,000 tax credit for each of them times all the businesses in America that might qualify, that's a month, that's a pile of money. And we are still throwing money around at that kind of level and wondering why we have inflation. But then again, if you own a business, maybe you should call your CPA about some free money. <laughs> Here's another uh, fun one. You remember those stimulus checks that went out a while ago? $1,000 here, $1,000 there. Biden administration was sending these out. Certain families will get a thousand bucks, you know. Anyways, the result is the massive amount of money that was needed to fund that program caused the very inflation that wiped out any benefit that family would now receive. Think about this for a second. If you were a low income family, what would you rather have? A thousand dollars here, a thousand dollars there? Or would you like to have fuel prices low enough that you can afford to drive to work? or food prices low enough that you could afford to feed your family. But I digress. Fun fact, inflation is generated by more than just fiscal stimulus, it's also generated by supply problems such as the ones we are experiencing right now. Did you know that we have over 100 container ships sitting off the coast of Los Angeles that can't unload because we can't get our acts together enough to be able to unload them? Did you know that the dock workers are working without a contract since June and they're doing it for the benefit of America because they know that they should, but again, we can't get them a contract? I ordered a specialty garden hose for my garden last February. It still has not arrived. We were supposed to have turkey at our carving stations tonight, but wouldn't you know there's a worldwide shortage of turkeys? <laughs> Go figure. So we have pork instead, and it's delicious, but who knew there was a worldwide shortage of turkeys? Leadership problem. You know, and true leadership would solve this in a heartbeat. The lack of semiconductors remains a huge problem. There's a semiconductor bill that's been stalled in Congress for years that would reduce Americans' dependence on semiconductors from Taiwan and overseas. Did you know dishwashers are on back order for over a year now? Because we can't get the stupid semiconductors that makes them run. It's the one part that you can't complete an assembly without. We call it the golden bolt. You can't build the thing without that one tiny little part. You could hold up an entire assembly line of Teslas for lack of one stupid little semiconductor, and we can't get this bill jammed through Congress that would help, it makes me wonder why there's no urgency in Congress and what the real reason that they won't push it through is. I don't know. But again, good leadership could help resolve that. We need to re-domesticate our supply chain. COVID proved that just-in-time inventory is fatal we need to rely less and less on overseas manufacturing. We need to unleash American resolve, American ingenuity, American values of perseverance and hard work. We could even solve the fuel problem simply by unleashing American energy independence. But the current administration is having a keep it in the ground policy. This is uh, a chart that shows the various fuel usages over time, and there's a little follow over here on petroleum. That's the current administration shutting down production. But what's amazing to me is that tiny little blip, and that's how much we actually use. We are a fossil fuel driven economy. We can't turn it off in a heartbeat. And if we do, we're going to start to run into problems like this. My belief is. The rising cost of food, lumber, supplies, baby formula, steel, whatever you want to call it, is all driven by increasing fuel costs. We could eliminate inflation simply by unleashing American energy independence. You can't grow a carrot without fuel. 
So if we unleashed American independence, I think the inflation problem would be over. If we did that, we would have a rally that would take your head off. And yes, climate change is real. And yes, burning of fossil fuels is a problem. And yes, we need to gravitate to a green economy. And yes, true leadership could help to make that happen too. We would create new industries, new jobs, new technologies. Elon Musk has shown us the way. And I believe in that. We need leadership and effective policy that will help us deal with the fuel problem now and lead us into a green economy into the future. We can do it. We can do better. We have to do better. And November is coming. And the question is whether it will be a wave or a tsunami. And if we get a Republican sweep in Congress, it is reasonable to be optimistic that we will see movement on energy, crime, infrastructure, supply chain problems, business regulations, other leadership issues. But for now, we have the central banks raising interest rates at the fastest rate we have seen in 28 years. And most people agree they acted too late. And to make up, and now to make up for it, they're doing what they're doing, and you and I are paying the price. One of the smartest thinkers I know of on investments in economics, Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater, recently published a book called Principles, or excuse me, why, uh, The Changing World Order. This thing is, uh, it's a monster. It's like that. I've got it up here. It's like reading a textbook, but it's fascinating if you're into this kind of stuff. I'm a weirdo. I'm into it. So he says that the federal banks should try to smoothify, that's a business term, smoothify, the economy and not hit the brakes too hard and the gas harden and have these big you know, swings back and forth. But instead, the Fed is printing money at a rate of a trillion a year and then pulling it back at a rate of 1.1 trillion per year. And we then experience the big lurch forward and then the big lurch backwards. And now there is no way that the Fed can fight inflation without creating economic weakness. And we're going to pay for that. Had they exercised good leadership, it might not have been that way. So one possible side effect is recession. Another lesser known one is something called skimpflation. Skimpflation. And that's where the price of something remains the same, but the quantity that you receive of it or the level of service that you get is less. And here's some examples. I know you've seen this in one form or another. And it's insidious. It's worse than inflation because we don't see it as clearly. It's hidden. It really can't be measured. But believe me, it's everywhere, and I know you have your own examples of it. This is now what a double stuff Oreo looks like. <laughs> something that was more, something that was better, and now is less, and yet the price remains the same, or perhaps is even a little bit higher. And whether it's a product that you purchase or the service that you receive on the airlines, that's skimflation. And it goes hand in hand with inflation, and it is everywhere. I don't know whether this one is real or not, <laughs> but now you can get a single Pringle. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> We need a return to traditional American values of hard work, great service, great products offered at a reasonable price from a domesticated supply chain. It's harder and harder to do once we accept less of something. And we've been accepting less for a long time. We learned to accept a lot less with COVID. And now we're re-educating ourselves how to get back into the workforce and how to produce quality products again. It's hard to return back to more of something. We're accepting less and less, and it's everywhere. And I'm going to challenge each and every single one of you to fight it wherever it is that you see it. Modest inflation is normal. 1% to 2% inflation per year is actually important. We need to have that for things to work right. But 8% inflation per year is deadly. And there's more than one way to fight inflation than just raising interest rates and reducing the money supply. Excellent leadership could help us to solve problems and loosen regulations to prevent businesses from expanding. In fact, if I were in charge, <laughs> here are some things I would do that would have an immediate effect and would generate a rally that would take your head off. Number one, let's soak up, soak up extra money. 
Inflation skyrocketed after the passage of a $1.9 trillion stimulus bill. There was too much money rattling around out there. We've got to repurpose the $200 billion that is still rattling around out there. Number two, let's unleash American energy independence smartly, intelligently, wisely. Let's use our increased capacity to invest in future green technologies. Let's research carbon uh, capture ideas. Let's clean up the planet. We have to do it. Number three, let's remove b barriers to business expansion. Let's decrease the lengthy and cumbersome process of, of going through a permitting if a, as a business. Regulatory costs today are three times what they were for Obama and 40 times what they were for Trump's administration. Let's make tax reform permanent. There's a consistent threat from the Biden administration of repealing the tax cuts that went into play a little while ago, and that inhibits businesses' incentives to grow and invest and create new jobs. Let's eliminate the incentives not to work. One of my very good friends runs a cafeteria across the street. We get our sandwiches there. He's got a high, you know, hiring sign. I go in and talk to him and say, what's going on? The sign's been up here forever. He says, I can't get people to come back. I've got people I've called three and four times to see if they would come back and they won't come back. And I said, well, what are they doing? He says they're sitting at home on their couch smoking pot. I mean, God bless them, but <laughs> let's get back to work. Let's re-domesticate the supply chain. Let's encourage green economies and businesses to flourish. And just because if I'm going to be in charge, I'm going to throw this one out there. Let's ban all single-use plastic with the exception of the healthcare industry. So we could show excellent and strong leadership regarding Ukraine and Russia as well. But we're not. It's the Hungarian prime minister. He's the one that's pushing hard for a ceasefire. And we're hopeful and optimistic that that will come to, see, uh, to, come to pass. Because Russia is losing manpower, equipment, ammunition, and support at home at an unsustainable rate. They cannot take on new territory without a substantial cost, both financially, in lives, and in political support. So they will likely start to consolidate the territory they already have. We're already seeing them put puppet governments into place in the territories they currently hold. Now that's not the best outcome for Ukraine, but at least the fighting stops. And if we get that, we will get a rally that will take your head off. Russia is seeing increasing pressure to end the conflict. They've been forced to accept Finland and Sweden's decision to join NATO. Their recent decision to cut gas sales to European countries we think is going to come back to hurt them because they're going to become under increasing pressure to change that as the winter approaches. And frankly, they need those finances to pay for the war in Ukraine and replace the equipment that they've lost. It's unsustainable. It can't continue. Ukraine will normalize soon, and when it does, we will get a rally that will take your head off. COVID is fading into the background. Yes, there are new strains. Now we've got the monkey pox thing, whatever. But the virus is being contained and stamped down. The virus's goal is to replicate and survive, but if it kills everybody, it's not going to replicate and survive. So a virus is going to adapt to be more mild and more transmissible. It will eventually become like the common cold and it will fade into the background as a nuisance. Also soon we're getting the nasal vaccine and that will take care of any last holdouts that are afraid of needles. So we think COVID will fade into the background and as it does, we will get a rally that will take your head off. So will we get a recession? The answer is probably yes, and in fact, technically speaking, we are in a recession right now, except for the current administration is now trying to change the definition of what a recession is. It's in the dictionary, it's right there. Go look it up. Recession, two back-to-back -back quarters of negative growth. Simple. So the problem is there's a six to nine month delay between when we raise interest rates and when it shows up into the economy. And that's the concept of a soft landing. If I change interest rates now, what's the effect six to nine months from now? I can't really tell. Do I push too hard and drive us into recession? Or is it just enough that we have this nice breezy landing? I'm not so sure they can pull it off based on how I've seen the feds handle it so far. So feds are likely to continue to raise interest rates. And so we're likely to see a continued slowing of the economy. In fact, some folks are warning of a scenario called stagflation. And stagflation, <laughs> st 
stagflation is when we get increasing cost but reducing employment and economic output. Bottom line, we should be aware and cognizant of changes to the economy and the climate. I know a lot of you come to us and say, what do you think is going to happen next? Well, we think we're going to see a continuing rally through the summertime and into the fall, very likely as we punch through the November elections. You know, and some of this could be yucky as we get to into the next year when we see stagflation or recession or whatnot, but I think it's going to be offset a little bit by new technologies and new productivities. We have future businesses and disruptive technologies that haven't quite yet matured, but show incredible promise. And one of them, of course, is SpaceX and trips to Mars. That's really cool. Another one, though, this is one of my favorites. We are very close to cracking the code on nuclear fusion. And fusion is the power of the sun, and the byproduct is water. So this would be groundbreaking. It would change and solve our energy problems forever, as in finished, permanently done. And we're very close to it. Wireless technology will continue to expand. Cloud computing, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, lithium battery technologies, all look promising, and all will likely generate productivity that will offset any potential recessions that we might see next year. So overall, I think there's reason to be optimistic. There's always the cycle that we go through, up, down, up, down. Investments, though, will always do what you want them to do. They will always go up. They just won't do it on the time scale that you wish that they would. They will do it in fits and spurts, but in the long run, it will go up for one single driving reason, and that is because we are always producing more babies. And the more babies and the more things that they purchase, the economy will expand and expand until we have to leave this fine planet of ours and expand even further out. Any uh, folks a big fan of the show called The Expanse, science fiction show? Man, you guys, you got to write this down in your tablet. It's called The Expanse. And it shows what this world might be like 200 years from now, and it is super, super cool. But the secret to watching The Expanse is to start with season two, then season three, then season one, and then season four. Trust me. <laughs> so anyways, we think we have a few years before we return to growth. We won't see real change, I think, until we get a change in the White House. And so that's the time frame that we're probably looking at. So be prepared to ride through this storm and to see sideways movement in the market for some period of years. Lots of noise, lots of volatility, lots of clickbait, lots of scary stuff, sideways. And probably three or so years before we start to see portfolios come out the other side again. I think we're right around here. We might have crossed on the fear side about a month ago, and now we're heading back the other side. I can tell this part by how much my phone rings and the phones have been quieting down. So what do we do? Don't cash out, stay the course. Let's ride this out through the midterms. Let's see what goes on with the midterm election and what policies might come into play. I think we can get back to 34, 35,000 on the Dow by that time. I think we're headed that direction. There's some math and some research that suggests that we could get to 39, 39 on the Dow, which would be pretty cool, and with opportunity beyond that. So hold fast with what you have. If you have money on the sidelines, I might encourage you to start bringing up back in. If you have cash on hand, if you have money in stable value in your 401s, bring in 25% of it. And if it goes well, bring another 25%. Because when the market turns, it turns on a dime. And we probably have already seen market bottom just a few weeks ago, and now we're coming back. Believe me, the downturn will eventually end. You can bet on it. Bears will run out of firepower, and the 26 trillion of cash that is held on the sideline by individual investors like you and I will come pouring back in. You can bet on it. And when it does, we will get a rally that will take your head off. There are several investment categories I think look promising. I'm a big fan of dividend producers right now. Things that we use every single day financials, health cares, industrials, consumer services, staples. Razor blades, you know, wireless service, Johnson Johnson, Procter & Gamble, Verizon Wireless, ExxonMobil. Those kinds of things have actually weathered quite well and are expected to continue to do so. Here's a fun story, last story of the night. There's a fund that we use uh, that is a, it's a, a treasuries and uh, uh, high yield bond fund. 
And 90% of the money that normally would be invested in that fund is not in the fund. It's in cash. They're holding it in reserve. So why would we have a fund that's supposed to invest in treasuries and high yield that is sitting on 90% in cash right now? It's because they don't think that strategy is likely to produce results in this environment. But that very same company has a, a muni fund and they are 100% invested in the muni fund. What's my point? My point is there are some strategies that are likely to bear fruit more so than others. And I think we should look out for and seek out those strategies and of course we will help you to do that. So hold fast. With the investments you have, monitor the news, monitor the markets, and by all means, yes, let's stay in touch. Let's plan to have some conversations around the midterm and beyond. We may want to do some fine tuning at that time, but for now, hold fast. And as we get closer to the elections, we'll have more data, more clarity. We'll reach out. We'll know more what to do. Monitor Facebook. That's how we can get a lot of information out very, very quickly. Because you know in the end, you can worry about war. You can worry about the economy, you can worry about disease, you can worry about leadership. You can blame the left, blame the right, blame the lazy, blame the greedy, blame financial advisors if you have to. But I'm going to encourage you to maintain a long-term investment mix of 60% optimism and 40% humility. And as always, thank you for your business, thank you for your relationship, and thank you for your continued confidence in what it is that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the night. Thank you. Thank you.